Um, let's make a start. I'm gonna just, we're not getting straight into the first song, but if we could have the words up on the screen, that'd be great. Happy Easter, by the way, to all of you. Good to see you. I hope you've had a good day. I know somewhere here this morning. Good, to, good for Christians to gather on this day, on every Sunday, but particularly on this day. Now, this, this is a great Easter hymn, and we are declaring to each other, it really happened. I just want to have you to have a look at this hymn and think, okay, where does, can you recognize where some of the bits in the Bible come from? Can you see any phrases um, from these verses? Um, what Bible passages, basically, do you see echoed here? The best songs are really the Bible sung. Where's the Bible here? Maybe we could go into verse 2 as well. And feel free to shout them out if you want. Where's, where's this from? Don't have to say which gospel, but the gospels? Yeah, yeah. Jesus coming out of the... Um, that's kind of the level I'm on at the moment. Yeah. The gospels. Um, Okay, um, verse three, three is a good one for this. Um, see any Bible, bit of Romans. Bit of Romans. Where, where, do you see, where do you see a bit of Romans, Paul? More than, More than conquerors, yeah. That's chapter eight. Joshua, Joshua okay. We'll, we'll through explain. Through Jordan. through Jordan, through the river, yeah, into the promised land. So using that promised land picture. Okay, anything else? Um, and the chorus, let's have a quick look at the chorus. Um, great. And um, where is the phrase? Uh, uh, okay, back to the second verse. Yeah, end of second verse. Uh, there's another one there. Death has lost its sting. Um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 talks about the resurrection has happened, talks a lot about that and how we can be certain of it, and then uses this language. Um, in fact, let me just go to, to that passage in 1 Corinthians 15. David, if you could get that one up. Brilliant. Okay. So Paul is talking, and why don't, why don't we stand together and sort of go from this straight into the song. It's a great declaration along with Paul. This has happened. Let's encourage one another of the reality, the historical reality of Christ's resurrection. Um, so I'll read the bit in black, we'll read the bit in red together, then we'll go straight into the hymn, and then we'll go back to this, and I just want to read off another verse as we pray and pray for ourselves. So, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Together, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Let's remain standing and sing. Glory. 
We're going back to those verses in 1 Corinthians. Um, it goes on to say, David, if we could have the next slide on, it goes on to say this, because Christ is risen, death is no longer triumph, uh, triumphant. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your, your labor is not in vain. What you do now is not wasted because Christ is risen. Christ opens up the future, opens up heaven to the Christian. So let's allow it to encourage us as we look at Romans tonight. We're looking at some strong language about humanity and we can come and hear the preaching of the word. It's not in vain tonight. Let's pray, shall we, that um, we would realize just how valuable these things are now, that it's not in vain. Father, we thank you. Thank you that Christ has died for sins, and we praise you that Christ is risen, vindicated and proven to be right and true, and the Son of God, and the risen Christ, the glorious Christ. Father, thank you that it shows that all your promises are true. Thank you that because of that, there is a man in heaven Thank you that as Corinthians also says, just as we were made like the man of dust, so we will be made like the man of heaven. Thank you that that means that all we do in this life is no longer in vain. But whatever we do when we're doing it for the Lord, it is um, valued and used by you. Father, help us to um, make good use of our time together now, to hear your word together now, to pray and sing, encourage one another and to go out into the world this week knowing that truth applies wherever we are and whatever we do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. Do you please have a seat? Um, and very warm welcome to you on this Easter Sunday evening. Um, let me give a few notices. If you've seen the bulletin, um, you will know that most things take a bit of a break over the school holidays as usual, although we are having a central prayer meeting this week. That's not obvious from the this week section, but this Wednesday evening, as usual, on the first Wednesday of the evening, we'll meet in here to pray. Um, look forward to, to seeing you there. As we heard this morning, we've got a bunch of students in this week as well. You might hear about that. Um, and just check the bulletin for other things. There's a note from our mission partners, Mark and Jill, thanking us for, for some financial support, a particular gift we were able to give to help them with their, their home. Um, I don't think there's anything else I want to point out. Next Sunday is largely as, as normal. Um, do be aware of when different ministries are restarting um, after Easter. Um, but let's take a moment before before we sing and come to Romans, to, to pray. And um, Jonathan, I think it's just you. You've been stood up with the other students, haven't you? Come, come, and, come and join me. We just want to hear at some point over this weekend um, from how we can pray for some of our students. And this weekend seemed a good time because we've got a load of you coming in this week. Um, we've got, as Michael said this morning, Students from Loughborough see you coming and staying over. Plans going all right for that? Yeah, I, 
I hope so. I hope so. Great. We've got about 30 of us coming and staying in the building over this week. Brilliant. How, um, yeah, it'd be, be great to know how we can pray for that. You know, what, what would be a successful week from your perspective? I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. We haven't prepared these questions and answers at all. But, but what would make you think by the end of the week, oh, that's gone really well. I'm glad we did that because that would help us to, to pray for you tonight. Yeah, sure. So we're going through some of the old Word Alive talks as a replacement for Word Alive. Um, so prayer that that would be good, that would be invoking good discussions would be, would be great. Um, and logistically as well, that it just runs nice and smoothly would be quite nice. Okay, because you're sort of taking responsibility for that. Yeah, yeah great. <laughs> and um, so sort of general question, um, you know, when you see other students around, ask them these perhaps, you know, perhaps what's one encouragement? Because we don't, we're not there at university but I hear there are good things going on. The gospel is being shared. Perhaps give us one encouragement and um, one other thing we can pray for. You've given us one already. But yeah, one encouragement, first of all, from being a student at Loughborough. Yeah, we had a brilliant events week at the start of February. Um, loads of people came along for the first time and loads of people have continued to come along and have got actually quite stuck into local churches. So a thanks prayer for that. And also pray that they'd continue to come, continue to be asking the questions that they've been asking, which have been brilliant. Um, Is yeah. there a name in particular, someone we can pray for who's on your mind? Uh, no, there have been quite a few people. Yeah. Yep. There have been okay. maybe five or so people that have consistently been coming back and yeah. coming along to churches. Great. Been great. And anything else we can pray for, or should we just stick with praying for this week? Yeah, I think praying for this week would be, yeah. would be good. Okay. Brilliant. Jonathan, grab a seat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let's, let's include also in our prayers, um, prayer for the persecuted church. It can be particularly tough being a Christian in certain countries at Easter. So, for example, if you've been using the prayer for the Muslim world, um, you'll, you'll know that because that will come up quite often. Um, not necessarily being a Christian at Easter, but just being a Christian in the country they're in. So for today, the, um, the country is Egypt, and um, there are many Christians in Egypt, but many of them don't make that very obvious, because um, to be a Muslim and become a Christian brings the, the sort of wrath of the authorities. That's the thing they really don't like. So for example, here's one man called Abdallah. He's a, a doctor, a Muslim doctor who wanted to convert, but he could not openly confess his faith. His wife comes from a very devout Muslim family, and his children are students in a particular university which trains Muslim missionaries. Abdallah was moved to faith by a Christian neighbor who was treated very badly, but never lost his temper, and even helped those who were in need. That made Abdallah ask questions about how his neighbor could be so different. Let's pray, shall we, together? Father, we want to thank you so much. Thank you that, as Jonathan has said, and many of our other students would attest, thank you that the gospel is going out in campuses around the country. Thank you that conversations are happening, talks are being given, Bibles are being opened, people are coming to church and inquiring. And Father, we pray particularly for these um, students at Loughborough that you would bring them right through to faith. Father, we pray for all of our students that you'd encourage them in their witness and as we've just been reminded in their life as well, knowing that even the little things can show um, a, real, a real faith in Christ. Um, and can be used by you to bring people to faith. Father, we do pray for this week. We pray that this building would be able to be used really well to encourage these students not able to go to Word Alive, but we pray the talks would be um, just great for building them up and teaching them and helping them to grow together. And we pray that Jonathan would have that, those answered prayers of logistics going well and um, the Christians being edified there. Father, we want to pray so much for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Egypt. We pray for those who are really kind of keeping below the radar, but we don't want to judge anyone for that. It's really hard for us to know what we would do in that situation. We simply pray for them. 
We thank you for bringing them to faith in Christ. And we pray that you keep that faith strong. And that most of all, you keep them faithful. And that they would never deny the Lord Jesus. And that you would help them to know what that looks like day by day in such a difficult situation. So, Father, we thank you that you have your people there in Egypt. Please build your church there. Be glorified in that place. And may the gospel transformation, life by life, continue to have a knock-on effect to many, many more people. Father, we want to pray for our church family. We thank you um, for, for the church family that you've put us in here. And we pray for those who... Um, particularly at Easter, feel the loss of someone, feel a life that is gone or a life that is under threat or feel the weakness of body. We pray for Ulrika, she looks back, and others who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who have great weakness of body and uncertainty. We pray for, um, for Leone in particular with her treatment, but others as well, for Margaret after her surgery, Lord, you know all of the things going on, even in our minds tonight, and worries and concerns, but also joys, and we bring those to you now, and pray that you would lead us, and you'd encourage us to know that our work in the Lord is not in vain because of the resurrection. Father, help Michael now as he comes and brings your word to us. Help us, we pray, to be really attentive to your word, and we ask and trust that you have Um, you're going to speak to us by your Holy Spirit and through your word to change us and make us more like Jesus. We bring all of these prayers to you now in his name. Amen. We're going to sing one more time and then Michael's going to come and take us to Romans. Let's sing a song that um, helps to prepare our hearts now in reverence and awe. Um, We gather round your word. It's really the only way to come to the Bible. So let's stand. Searches everything, my secret desires. Your word is like a hammer and a fire. It breaks it purifies. So Do you have a seat, guys? Well, we've been thinking over the last couple of weeks in our series in Romans all about the wrath of God being revealed on men 
If you could turn up with me, Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. We're going to do a little bit of setup before we come to it, but page 940 in the church Bibles. In a moment, I'm going to read Romans chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. But before we read that, just a little bit of a setup. Remember, we're looking at what God is going to do about sinfulness. Paul has been expanding, has been exploring um, the depths of human lostness. The reason why the salvation found in the gospel is such a precious thing, why human beings need saved, saving, is because of our ungodliness the corruption and depravity of body and mind. And so back in chapter 1, verse 18, it says that the wrath of God is being revealed against the unrighteousness of men. People, people like you and me have God's anger, God's judgment hovering over them. It's like the sniper sight is on us. Mankind has a judgment of God's wrath hanging over them. But so far in Paul's writing about this judgment hanging over people, so far it could be understood to be mostly speaking about the Gentile world, really, the non-Jewish world. For the Roman church, Christians at the time in Rome, made up of both Jews and Gentiles, as they were listening to Romans 1 and reading through it and hearing it, for most of them, I think it would have most immediately made them think of Roman society, their neighbors, the people they were sort of rubbing shoulders with every day, with all of the idols and paganism of Roman society that they were just there, they were surrounded by all the time, all the sexual immorality that was right on their doorstep. As they listen to Romans 1, as they read Romans 1, I think it would have been very easy for people from a Jewish background to kind of assume this is talking about Gentiles. We're kind of on the outside and we're looking in at God talking about them and what hovers over them. I think it'd be very easy for a lot of people, people from a Jewish background, maybe Christians from a Jewish background, maybe people who are just Jews, who are sort of part of the society here, part of the community here, to think, he's talking about someone else. I'm on the outside looking in. I'm listening to Paul talking about other people. And what Paul does in this passage is he turns and he addresses those who think they're spectators in all of this and says to them, you have no excuse. Every one of you who judges. I don't know if you've ever been in a, a performance, a stage play or something like that, where the actors have come down into the, the seating and they've been acting in the midst of you and you've suddenly gone from sitting there feeling like you're just watching something, to suddenly you're part of it. There's almost a sense of that in this passage. Paul is talking about the lostness of man, the depravity of man, and it's as if he's on the stage and he's talking about all of this, and then he suddenly turns and he talks to the audience and he says, what about you? What about you guys who think you're looking in on me talking about other people? You have no excuse, every one of you who judges. So in our passage tonight, we're looking at what Paul has to say about those who seem to assume that they're okay when we talk about sin, when we talk about God's judgment. People that assume we'll be all right. So I'm going to read Romans 2, verses 1 to 11. Please do follow along with me as I do so. Paul says this, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? 
But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first, and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first, and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Let's pray, shall we? Father, help us with this passage, we ask. Help me as I speak. May I only say what is from you, what is true and faithful to this passage. Help all of us as we listen. Grow us in our knowledge of you, our love for you, our appreciation for the salvation that is found in the gospel. Amen. So Paul turns his focus. In the previous passage, I don't know if you noticed, but in chapter one, where Paul is talking about the lostness of mankind and exploring that story of depravity and rejection of God and rebellion and sin, there's a lot of they and them. They did this, they did that, they are that, they are this. Now, Paul says, you. Verse one, you have no excuse, everyone who judges. There's almost a deliberate changing of direction as Paul talks. In verse three, again, he says, you who judges. And throughout the passage now, he's addressing those who hear about God's judgment on mankind, but have so far assumed I'm just kind of watching all of this happen. And actually, from a Jewish perspective, maybe I'm hearing all this stuff about judgment on the Gentiles, and it's like, yep, 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 love it, great. What about you? Paul says. So this passage really is Paul talking to those who think they're okay. To those who think they're okay. Those who can always think of a better example of a sinful person than themselves. Maybe that's us. Those who can always think of a better example of a sinful person than the one they see in the mirror. Those who can always think of a better example of lostness of mind or depravity of morality. Paul turns his focus to those who hear the stuff about God's judgment, but kind of assume it's not really as much for them as it might be for others. I think this is a passage that's going to challenge us. We think for ourselves and we think about our society, think about the temptation of the Roman Christians to look at the society around them and shake their heads and say, our country's in such a mess. Our neighbors are so lost. But to actually do so pointing the finger and to ignore our own sin. I wonder if any of us are kind of okay with the idea of God judging because we can think of people that deserve it. I think we've all done that, haven't we? I think for Paul writing to the Roman Christians at the time, there was a real risk that those from a Jewish background knew that the judgment of God was a real thing and would have affirmed it and said, you know, we want to be on the right side of it. But actually, it's not something we have to worry about in the same way as even maybe our Gentile brothers and sisters. Maybe there's a sense of our Gentile brothers and sisters, they were saved for some real lostness, some real depravity. They were like, whoo, that was really bad. You guys, yeah. I mean, God's really kind to you by saving you. But, you know, us, we've always sort of had one foot in the door. The Jewish assumption was that God was okay with them. That was the cultural assumption. And that judgment would fall on other people. This first section is dedicated to addressing that Jewish assumption that we're going to be all right. Next week, as we go into verses 12 to the end of the chapter, Nathan is going to take us to some specifics, looking at the Old Testament law and circumcision. But for the time being tonight, the assumption seems to be this. 
Paul seems to be talking to people who kind of say, well, I'm a descendant from Abraham, so I'm kind of all right. One commentator I was reading this week said this about the beliefs that had built up in the mind of Jewish people in between the Old Testament and the New Testament in that kind of intervening few centuries. And he says this, the literature of intertestamental Judaism, that's sort of the religious practices, the religious writings that were written between the Old and the New, the literature of the intertestamental Judaism, while consistently stressing the need for Jews to repent of sin, also tended to highlight Israel's favored position to the extent that its security in God's judgment was virtually unassailable. That's basically saying that they said, yep, we shouldn't sin. Yep, you should repent for sin when you sin. But really, the judgment and us, not something we really need to worry about. And the Jewish person had been taught ever since they were little that there is sin, and there are sins, and you shouldn't do them. But real sin, that's something Gentile nations do. And God will judge them for that. You can see this attitude in, um, in the Gospels. You think about John chapter 8 when Jesus is talking to people about being the offspring of Abraham. Read through John chapter 8. And people are saying, we have Abraham as our father. We are the offspring of Abraham and we've never been enslaved by anyone. Abraham is our father. We're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. And Jesus challenges them to say, well, what does that actually count for? So at the time, the Jews really thought they were okay. And I think there was probably a risk within a church, a Roman church, where there's a mixture of Jew and Gentile for there to be divisions amongst the church in terms of how serious the judgment is for someone who's come from a Jewish background or a non-Jewish background. And so Paul basically says to those who think they're okay, Oi, you lot who think you're all right, three things. First of all, you who think you're right, all right, don't ignore the wrong that you do. It's worth saying that within this section, Paul probably doesn't literally have people in the congregation in mind. It's not like I'm going to write this little bit for Darren because he really needs to hear this. There's a sense that he knows he's speaking in a kind of a, a sort of, a, he's using a literary device, engaging with an imaginary opponent, but an imaginary opponent that represents a very, very real attitude that many people would have had, a very widespread attitude. And what's his point here? Well, verse one, he says this, therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge, those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? He talks to the one who is judging, the one who has this attitude of being on the outside and looking in and says, what about you? You actually, you have no excuse yourself, do you? He challenges them directly. You don't have a valid reason to assume that when it comes to judgment, they are in the position of the judged and you are more kind of alongside the judge looking in and being like, let's watch what happens. It's a little bit like, you know, a couple of little kids are having a, a scuffle and it all gets out of hand. They're rolling around on the ground and the parent steps in and splits them apart. And the one who is kind of the most recent aggressor gets a telling off first. And the parent is sitting there and talking to that child and saying, I saw what you did. You shouldn't have done da 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 And the other child comes and shuffles over and stands next to the parent. It's like, yeah, yeah. And the parent just stops and says, hold on, I'm not done. I'm, not, I'm coming to you. There's this assumption that I'm, I'm over this side with God looking at those that are going to be judged. And Paul here turns and he kind of says, you have no excuse yourself. You have no valid reason to assume that this escapes you, that this has nothing to say to you. Don't ignore the wrong that you do, Paul says. You think you're so innocent? You think that God hasn't 
seen how you live your life, not just when you're with people, but when you're on your own? The things you say, the things you think. And it's not just that these people, these, this type of person, assumes they're innocent and that their sins are somehow lesser. It's not just that. It's also that they bring further judgment on themselves in their judging of others. Look at that. For in passing judgment, halfway through verse 1, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. You do the same things as those you're kind of looking down on. You're judging, you're standing apart from. Paul is probably listing, um, referring to the list in chapter 1, verse 29 to 30. Just flick back one page and have a look at that. Because I think it would have been easy for the Jews to have said, well, when it comes to sort of homosexuality, all that kind of stuff you talked about there, and all these kind of other things, you know, idolatry, we don't do that. Clearly, we don't follow idols. Clearly, we don't do all that kind of stuff. I think what Paul is referring to is he's, he's talking to this list in chapter 1, verse 29, as he talks about the lostness of man and how they are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, You are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. You are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, this long list. Paul says, this is you as well. You who are standing apart and saying this is about judgment falling on other people, you who think you're okay, you are all these things as well. Don't ignore the wrong that you do. Don't be all about the wrong things that others do and have no recognition of your own deserving of judgment, Paul says. It's a really simple point, but it's such an easy thing to do, isn't it? To notice sin, to notice error. So-and-so shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have said that to me. So-and-so's a little bit and he's taking down a notch. To notice selfishness in others before you see it in yourself. To notice pride in others before you see it in yourself. As Jesus said, to be the kind of people that attend to the speck in someone else's eye and not notice the plank in your own. Paul establishes a principle that all of his readers would agree with in verse 2. Throughout Romans, Paul is going to do this. He's going to say, right, we can all agree on this, yes? So therefore think, verse 2, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Yes? Yes. Right. Okay. Well, do you suppose then, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. When it just comes to doing wrong, being wrong, we are all in that same boat. And so for us, the challenge jumps right out. For those of us who think we're okay, are just trundling along like we're okay, don't ignore the wrong that we do. I think maybe one prayer that each of us can pray tonight on the back of this passage is simply this. Father, help me to have the right level of self-awareness when it comes to my own sin compared to the sins of others. The right level of self-awareness when I think about myself and when I'm looking at others. Because other people do sin, but we do as well. to those who think they're okay when it comes to God's judgment, who feel like they're standing on the edges watching on rather than actually involved. Don't ignore the wrong that you do. And secondly, don't presume on God's kindness. Paul carries on his point. These people are assuming that they're fine, even though they would affirm that God must judge sin. God judges sin. Happy to accept that, yes. And God's going to judge sinners, of course. And so Paul digs behind that position. Okay, you affirm that God must judge sin, but you feel like you're fine. Let's dig behind that. Why do you think you're fine? What's going on there? 
If we affirm that, you know, what we saw in 1 verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed against all of mankind, I mean, just on a really, really simple level, we think about us, maybe if you're a pal, if we believe that God does send bad people, if you want, just to really simplify it, to hell, there is such a thing as God sending bad people to a bad place. We believe that's true. But we're not worried about it. We should know why. We should know why we're not worried about it. If we're not worried about the wrong things that we do in general and our ongoing ability to do things wrong in the future, when we know that God punishes wrong, if we're not worried about that, we should ask why. When I was at uni, um, when essay deadline time would come about, everybody would be stressed out. They'd always be, you know, those of you that have been in uni more recently, you'll know. There's that week where they all come at the same time, and people that were usually out partying and kind of sleeping in and whatever else, they were locked in the library and getting up at the crack of dawn to kind of work, and everybody was stressed and everybody was working, but there was one person in my social circle that was never worried when it came to essay deadline time. My brother Paul, he was just not worried when everyone else was stressed out, staying up late, reading through academic journals, trying frantically to request that one book because it had that one quote that they needed to get and they didn't have the page number and da 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 da, da. When everyone else was like that, he was playing Xbox, he was lying in. He literally went on a little tour of the, the city where we lived, trying out a pie in every pub and writing a little test of which, which, who has the best pie in Canterbury. He wasn't stressed. He wasn't worried. But he had good reason. Because what he would do is at the beginning of term, he'd get his deadlines and he'd get them from the website where he'd see them and he'd write them in his diary a week in advance. And then he'd forget about them. He'd forget about the actual deadline and he'd just go by his, his diary deadline. So he always had all of his work done a week before everybody else. And so everyone else was worried and he was not. But he had a good reason. And when it comes to God's judgment, God's wrath, it's not something that we daily worry about, is it? But it is real. So what's our reason not to be worried? There is a good reason that exists. We're going to come to that later. But what's your reason? The people that Paul addresses here, they're not worried. But is it for a good reason? No, Paul says. Will you escape God's judgment? Paul asks, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Are you so used to thinking that God is patient, kind, forbearing, that you think he's just, he's just not the judgy kind? You know the difference between... Uh, a driving instructor and a driving test invigilator. A driving, a driving instructor, if you've taken driving lessons, at least my driving, my driving instructor, oh, she would not shut up. Every other moment, it was like, do this, stop that, do this, da 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 all the time, hearing no, 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 I could barely focus. Sometimes we think that because God is silent in our lives, we're not doing anything wrong. If I was doing such a bad job, surely something would be telling me. Paul here speaks of God not as being like the driving instructor or the person on the passenger seat giving you directions every five minutes, every minute, all the time. He speaks of God as being like an invigilator who sits there silently noting things down. Notice verse five. Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Just because God is patient and God is kind doesn't mean he's not looking, doesn't mean he doesn't see, doesn't mean he's okay with everything that he's seeing you do, say, think. I mean, the Jews, again, they knew that they sinned. Sure, we sin. Of course we sin. I mean, there's whole laws that we can measure ourselves against. We'll think about that next week. Laws that we'll measure ourselves against. I know I messed that up. I know I messed that up. But you know, Abraham is our father. 
and Moses. Ever heard of them? That's us. This passage sums it up quite well. This is taken from the intertestamental writings. This is a, called the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 15. So this is not Bible, but this is teaching that comes in between Old Testament and New Testament that would have been accepted by Jews. And it says this, But thou, O God, are kind and true and patient and ruling all things in mercy. For even if we sin, we are thine, knowing thy power. Even if we sin, we're yours. We're in the club. You'll be patient with us. And if we're here tonight and we think, well, God won't judge me because God is love and God is patient and God is kind and all of these things I've always grown up with and it's sort of God's job to forgive me and it's, you know. I mean, you're right, God is patient, God is kind, but there's a reason why he's not judging you now and verse four explains it. It's not that he's not looking. It's not that he's fine with everything that's going on. Verse four, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's patience is not because he hasn't seen your wrongdoing or because your wrongdoing is somehow you know, a tier three rather than a tier one. God's patience with our sin, individuals in this room, is not God saying, carry on. I don't see anything wrong. Just crack on. Rather, as Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that you should all reach repentance. And so for those of us that think we're okay, we need to stop and we need to remind ourselves God is patient, God is kind. God is not judging right now. He's giving time for you to repent. For you to realize the state of your heart and to say, I need a savior. I can't do this on my own. God is not okay with you just carrying on in the same kind of way. If we're here tonight and we're trusting in the Lord Jesus, it's a reminder to us, isn't it, that the life of trust in the Lord Jesus is a life of continuous repentance. Continually recognizing the lostness of our own heart, the brokenness of our own human state, and saying, I need Christ every day. It's why we have the Lord's Supper again and again, as we were reminded a few weeks ago when we thought about the catechism, Eidelberg Catechism, that feeding on Christ, because we know we are broken, we know we are lost. We know we can't do it ourselves, and so we come in reliance, in dependence, again and again and again. Repentance is not a one-and-done thing. For some of us, we need to repent for the first time. That's going to be a big one. But for those of us who have repented already, it's not done. We keep coming back to this. We don't want to be people that presume upon God's kindness and ignore the wrong that we do. Don't ignore the wrong you do. Don't presume upon God's kindness. And lastly, don't forget how God judges, the mechanism by which he judges. Verse six, he will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Paul is not saying here, there are some people that just do a good enough job that they get to earn eternal life. What he's saying in verse 7 is he's kind of establishing and zooming in on what he said in verse 6. God renders to each one according to his works. Works earn you something. These works, verse 7, if someone was able to do these works they would get the eternal reward, whereas somebody who does these works earns this reward. He's expanding on that verse six principle. The main thing he's trying to say is verse 11, God shows no partiality. What we do, how we live, who we are, that's what God sees. That's what God bases his judgment on. Your family name makes no difference. Where you were born makes no difference. How many Bible verses you have memorized 
makes no difference. Paul is going to go on to establish later on in the book that there is no one righteous, not even one. So what he's doing at the moment, he's just setting up a pattern that the readers can kind of affirm. Okay, if you were able to do all this kind of stuff, then you'd earn this. Agree? Agree. Okay, and if you were going to do all of this kind of stuff, then you'd earn this. Agree? Agree. Okay, as we move into Romans, we're going to see nobody can do that. But for the moment, he's just setting up the pattern. God gives according to to what people have done. It's a little bit like a kind of earn-as-you-work kind of system. You know, you kind of work at a job, and the amount of work that you do translates in, you know, exactly into the wages you get. If you do half a day's work, you get half a day's wages. Here, there's this sense of God rendering, that sort of paying back, paying according to something else, according to the works that we do. There's a kind of a sense of balance to it. The work, the life you've lived. God renders according to our works. That has always been how God judges. Don't forget that that's how God judges. To the Jewish people, that really, really lands because for them, it's not so much about what I do as it is who I am. Sure, I do these little things, but I'm a Jew. So therefore, Paul here it's a hammer blow. God shows no partiality. Don't forget how God judges. God judges not according to our name, our ethnicity, to what we say we believe, but what our actions actually show we believe. I think this is an important thing for us. If we think for ourselves, saying we believe in Jesus, when it's an easy thing to do in certain environments, thinking, yeah, I'm a Christian, but your action is not showing it. If God judges like this according to our works, then we need to stop and we need to ask ourselves, we're trusting in the Lord Jesus, but what do our works show about what we believe? Are they consistent with what we say is true about ourselves, about the world, about the life to come? Being born into a Christian family makes no difference. How you live is what God sees. Being dedicated or baptized as a child or being in a Church of England background or whatever it might be. God sees what you do, what you say, what you think. The Jews would have found this really difficult. We'll explore that again next week, but... One commentator basically says this, that the Jews were thinking, but we have all of this other stuff. We have all of our traditions. We have all of our law that God has given us, and we're circumcised when we're little, and that's got to count for something, right? But the Jews all trust in that kind of stuff instead of anything else. And Doug Moo, in his commentary on this, he says, the Jews' reverence for their traditions is not essentially different from the idolatry of the Gentiles. You're just trusting in a different moral system. Next week, we'll think a little bit more, dig into the idea of the law, what value the law did have or didn't have in the life of Israel. What did they think it was doing and what was it actually doing? Circumcision as well. But God judges, has always judged on the basis of what you do, Paul says. So therefore, you who think you're okay, remember what is true about God's judgment. Verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. You might remember but back in chapter 1, verse 16, when, Jesus is, when God, um, Paul is talking about salvation, the gospel, he says the, power, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You remember that a few weeks ago? The salvation offer comes to the Jews first. They are privileged in that way. But here it seems to be saying that the flip side of that is that the judgment falls on you first. This kind of sequence is reflected here. 
Salvation, the gospel came to you first, the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so that dynamic of Jew first, Greek comes to judgment or to glory, verse 10. And so this is how God judges on the life that we live. And so when we see this, and we think of ourselves as potentially being those who are standing on the edge and looking in and acting like we're okay, and we hear, don't forget the wrong that we do. Okay, yeah, I do wrong. Don't presume on God's kindness. Oh, man. I'm really used to God being kind, and I, I forget that God also does judge and sees everything. And don't forget how God judges based on what I do, what I think, what I say. He hasn't missed a thing. Suddenly we are not standing on the edge watching God talking about somebody else. Suddenly God is talking about us. And we are reminded once more why we need saving. None of us in this room get to be complacent with this. None of us gets to say that we needed Christ's death and resurrection any less than anybody else or any more. I asked earlier what our reason for confidence is when we consider God's wrath. If, God is, if God's wrath is hovering over all of us and it is going to fall, but we're not worried about it, what is our reason for not worrying? There is a good reason, but there's only one. And the only reason we cannot worry about this is if we have put our trust in Jesus, in the cross and the resurrection, in the Easter events that we look at. Because when we see the lostness of mankind in chapter 1, going into chapter 2, we see again and again and again, my own works, what I do, who I am, and how I live. God sees all of that. None of it is missed. And is it adding up to God being fine with me and giving me eternal rewards? No, it's not. It's adding up to something a lot worse than that. And so therefore, I can't trust in myself. I can't trust in doing the right stuff or just being a bit better, reading my Bible more, even if that's a good thing to do. I have to place my trust in that person who can save me, who can do it for me, can take my judgment, God's wrath, away from me and onto himself. As we saw Jesus do this morning, as Barabbas is released and Jesus goes to the cross. He takes our wrath on himself. And so those of us in this room, we can live daily not worrying about God's judgment because it has already fallen on Jesus for us. We look at Jesus and we say, judgment has already fallen for me because it fell on him. And he rose again and he conquered the grave. And so now I live seeking to obey, trying to do what I can to honor him and glorify him with the life and the time that he gives me now, but knowing that no matter how much I fail, the wrath does not hover over me anymore. It has already fallen on him. And so we have to be people that say, okay, when the finger comes and points to me and says, what about you? What about the wrong that you do? What about the presumption? What about the assumption that God won't judge? What about how God judges? And we say, yep. I want to be a bit more self-aware about my own sin. Because the penalty's already paid for all of that. I have no confidence in myself in this. I have all the confidence in Christ. Let's just give ourselves a moment Let's think about for ourselves what our own walk with Christ is like, how we can be tempted maybe to to judge others. And let's just turn our minds and our hearts back to Christ and thank him once more for the fact that in him is found the righteousness that we so need. Let's have a moment of quiet.
Father, we confess before you once more our lostness. And we're sorry for the times when we look at others and we think, yeah, judgments for people like that. And even in small ways when we are more concerned with what other people should be doing that are not, rather than considering what we should be doing that is maybe more in line with the gospel that we are saved by. Father, we pray that you would help us not to be complacent. Help us not to treat your judgment as a maybe thing. Help us not to treat our own sin as a small thing that can just be swept under the carpet. Help us to see the the depths from which we have been saved. The depravity from which we have been rescued. So that we might glorify our Savior all the more. And once more, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the righteousness that is found in him. We thank you that he did not shy away from that cup of wrath, but he drained it. So that now those that are trusting in him can say the wrath has fallen, and now there is only glory ahead. Amen. We're going to sing as we close. It's a song that asks a question, well, kind of makes a statement, really. How can any of us come before God? How can any of us have hope of having eternal life and heaven and all of that to come? Only by grace, only by the generous gift of God in Christ can we enter. Grace is an undeserved gift. If you're here tonight and you're not really sure what the Christian life is about and you're maybe exploring it, Christian life is not about doing the right stuff often enough until God rewards you. The Christian life is about saying, I can't do it myself, but Jesus is the gift by which I can have hope. He's done it for me. Only by grace can any of us enter and have hope. As the music begins, let's stand and sing, shall we? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen.